you have your Bible, you want to turn into Proverbs. Proverbs chapter, I already forgot, 3, is it right? Yep, 3, verses 13 through 18. It's in the Old Testament. If you turn to the middle of the Bible, you might hit Psalms. And if you hit Psalm, then just go over to the right, and you'll hit Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. That's where we're going to launch from today. So when you hear someone, sorry, I'm still trying to get my bearings here. When you hear someone say, when you hear someone say this, that immediately threw up some red flags in my mind. You, you know what they're talking about, right? You know what, you know what that red flag means. Red flags, it's, it's an idiom, okay? That means warning or warning signs, okay? Now, dads, those of you who are dads and you have daughters, I want you to listen to this. Tell me if you hear any red flags in this. If you had a guy come up to your, come up to your door and say, yo, dude, I'm Trey, but people call me Crazy Train, and I'd like to take your daughter out on a date. You're cool with that, right, old man? Come on. Tell her to be at my house, pick me up around 10 p.m., because my online gaming league doesn't end until 9.30, all right? So if you heard that, that was probably, what, like a thousand red flags that immediately went up in your head, dads, where you, were, you, know, you would have probably said, uh, no, thank you, and don't ever come back here. But you know what those, and I, I want to show you some pictures of some people who probably ignored some red flags when they were doing what they were doing. So here's, here's one. There you go. Okay, air condition repair. You don't want to hire these guys. Okay, at some point when, when someone said, what if you just lean out the window and we'll hold your legs? That should have been a red flag for someone to say no. Next one. Look at that one. You got to really love that big screen TV to risk your life to take it home. Someone said, hey, what if we do it this way? And the guy said, that's a great idea. No red flags. Here's another one. Okay? <laughs> so at what, at what point does the driver go, you know, this just doesn't seem right. You know, I know the boat's supposed to go in the water, but this just doesn't, you know, so there's a big red flag. Next one. Okay? Okay. For those of you who are wondering, what's wrong with that? Morons is misspelled. Okay. Some of you looked at that and go, well, that's, that's funny, but no, okay. Next one. Okay, can I, can I confess something to you? Okay. Last service, totally by accident, I said, look what she did. And boy, everybody got up and left. Oh, just the ladies. But anyway, so I, I want to conf- I did that, and so not, not, and I apologize. So look what he did, okay? Or look what that teenager did. They couldn't wait for the, you know, for the U-turn lane. They just said, you know what, we, we got to do it now. Is there another one, or was that it? I think that was it. Oh, there's one. There you go. First of all, what are those adults doing there anyway? That's a park. Second thing, that guy goes, hey, I got an idea. What if I go, and in, in, in neither of the other two chose to stop him. They just said, hey, go for it. Now, um, after I said what I said in the first service, one of the ladies uh, came out to me and she said, I want you to know that all of those pictures that you showed, they were all men doing stupid things. And I said, you know, you're right. (laughs) They were all men doing those stupid things. So I don't know. what. But basically what's happening here is these people are ignoring these red flags. So we're we're in the middle of our Family Matters series and we're almost finished with this series. I know some of you are, are saying, gosh, how, how long is this going to go on? We're still talking about this? And I would say, yes, we're still talking about this. Why? Because families are important. All families are important. Whether your family is mom, dad, and two kids and a dog, or if your family is, you know, just single parent and child, or if you're just single adult or married, remarried, I don't know, step family, whatever your family is, your family is important to God, and therefore it's going to be important to us as a church. So when the family starts to break down, then everything is affected. And strong families, strong families made up of strong individuals make up a strong church. And as a church, we want to make sure that we talk about how a family can love God and to live out his design for our families. Now this morning, we're going to turn our attention back to marriage. We've talked about different topics. And and so this morning, we're we're going to look at marriage. And and you've you've heard me say this before and heard Chad say this, but our marriage is is under attack. And I'm not talking about the 
the kind of whole what the government did and redefining marriage. My focus this morning is on all the things that want to take our attention away from our spouse. Okay, All the things that want to take our attention away from our spouse. Now, this is not just a young adult sermon Okay, for newly married or, or just married or been married for less than 10 years. This is not just for them. This, this cuts across all ages. Now, you may be saying, well, we've been married 30 years and we've been married 40 years. What do we need to listen to this for? And I want to say this. Time does not equal a good marriage. Okay, Time doesn't equate to a good marriage. You've been married for 30 years, but you probably you just got, to, you just got used to, the, to being miserable or whatever. So I don't want you to say, well, we've been married for a long time, but, so that means that we have a great marriage. It may mean it, because a lot of people who've been married a long time have great marriages, and they've learned it. But I don't want you to stop listening just because you think, well, this isn't for us. Marriages start off with our complete and total attention on each other. If you, if, if you remember your wedding, okay, or if you had somewhat, a, somewhat of a traditional marriage where you exchanged vows, you, you probably remember the vows that you said to one another, or, or at least I hope you do, or have some idea of what you said. But, uh, and I've lost count. I've done close to 40 weddings and, you know, and been to, to more. But at every wedding that I've done, whether it was in a church or it was in, at a wedding venue, it was outdoors or someone's house. I, I did a wedding in, in someone's backyard uh, just the other day. Wherever it is, Okay, when we get to the vows, I've always, I always have the couples face each other. Okay, weddings that you've been to, you've probably seen the same thing. You say, that's no big deal. I've seen it too. I want them to face each other because, for one, they're marrying each other, so it's important that they say their vows to one another and, and not to me. And secondly, facing one another is a picture of what marriage should always look like. Husband and wife turn towards each other and not turned away from each other. Have you ever been to a wedding where the, where the couple say the vows, you know, back to back? No, you've never seen that. Or, 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 the, or the couple, you know, they're going through, the, the pastor or whoever's going through the vows, and they're kind of looking off into space, and they said, well, you know, we'll do you, and they'll go, you know, shrug their shoulders, I guess, I don't know, maybe, unless I get a better offer. You know, you, you don't see that. That doesn't happen in marriage. It's very much turned towards each other and not turned away from each other. You're face to face, you're looking at each other's eyes, and you're saying that I will always love you. Nothing will come between me and you. I covenant with you to make our relationship the top priority. I mean, there was a wedding here just last night, okay? And when it came to the vows, the pastor had the couple turn to one another, and they said their vows to each other. Now, it would be great if from, from that point on, from when we said the vows, that the couple, they, they could go through the rest of their lives facing one another, just looking into each other's eyes. Now, I know logistically that would, that would be a nightmare and cause a lot of problems, but the idea of facing each other, what the exchanging of those vows signifies, should be what we try to maintain for the rest of our marriages. But immediately, and I mean immediately, as soon as a couple walks out of the church or walks out from the wedding ceremony, there are things, there are people, there are responsibilities, there are pressures, and there are temptations that will work at taking your eyes off of your spouse and placing your attention on anything and everyone else. So if you have your Bible there, we're going to read in Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to read through verse 18, and some of you may have already read ahead and you look at that and you may go, well, what is... What does this have to do with marriage? Well, stick with me, and uh, we'll try to explain it. Here we go. Proverbs 3, starting in verse 13. It says, blessed, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Now, I think these, these verses, although they're not a traditional uh, mar marriage verses, I think they should probably be somewhere in our homes, whether we've written down on a card, stuck in a refrigerator, or by our nightstand, because this, this passage speaks to the benefits of wisdom. The benefit is that you are blessed. The Hebrew word for blessed there is esher, and it means happy. Or, or bless, joy. It's this, it's this kind of this, this state of being that no matter what else is going on, that you, you still have joy, you still have this contentment. And who wouldn't want that in a marriage? I mean, everyone would. 
And the key to that blessedness, the key to that joy, that happy marriage, is wisdom. Now these verses tell us that wisdom is better than riches. Wisdom leads to peace. Wisdom gives life. These verses tell us that wisdom gives a solid foundation. If you want a great marriage, then you will seek wisdom. Wisdom that comes from God. And what's wisdom in marriage? Well, here's my definition for today. Wisdom in marriage is this. It's living your life to honor God by honoring the vows that you made to your spouse before him. That's wisdom in marriage. Living your life to honor God by choosing to honor the vows that you made to your spouse before God. Now, it goes back to that whole face-to-face promise, okay? The covenant that you made to one another. And a vow, that, that's, that's a promise. It's a commitment. It's a pledge to one another. A, a vow is not, a, you know, a suggestion or, or a really good idea or if you get bored in marriage, try these things. That's not it. You, you, are, you are being intentional. You're, you're saying, I commit, I covenant with you. I promise to do these things. And if you want to be wise in marriage, then you'll do whatever it takes to make sure that your vows are more than words that you say just so you can get to the reception or or get to the honeymoon. Now, as I said earlier, there are things in life that want to distract you from those vows. And if those distractions are not handled properly, then they could lead to something that could do permanent damage to your relationship. There are red flags in marriage. And me kind of being the, uh, the prop guy here, I like to... I got a red flag, Okay. We're not just going to talk about it. I'm going to show you. You know, you're going to, this is going to be burned into your head here. The red flag. Okay. There are red flags in marriages that we need to recognize and then act upon. Okay. Wisdom, when you see the red flag or you notice the red flag, wisdom would say, do something about it. Now, a red flag, let let me explain it. A red flag is a warning. Okay. It doesn't mean that it's too late. Okay? You, you see the red flag in marriage, and it doesn't mean, oh, we're done, we're, we're, this is it, we're, 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 we're headed for divorce, this is over. No, that's not what a red flag is. It's just a warning, okay? But it's telling you that the conditions are right for something to happen, and you need to respond appropriately. To not respond to the red flag would be unwise. Now, here's the crazy thing. Sometimes we see these red flags, and we choose not to respond. Like these red flags, we just, we run, we just run right into them. I mean, they, they just hit us in the face, and we choose to not respond. And one of the reasons maybe sometimes why we don't respond is because of pride. We don't act because we think, well, that can't happen to us. Or we, we can handle it. That's, it's, it's really not that big of a deal. But Proverbs 16, verse 18, this is actually in your bulletin. It's printed out there in your bulletin. It says, first pride, then the what? Then the crash. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. Pride, okay, pride can destroy a marriage. Pride is very anti-marriage. Pride is about the individual and not about the couple. Pride is me and not us. Pride comes before the fall. And sometimes we choose to ignore these red flags because we're just too prideful. So let's look at some of the red flags that we've got to address. Red flags that come up in marriage. And being, being the nice guy that I am, I'm not only going to give you the warning, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the response to go with that warning. But what's going to happen is this. I'm going to go through the red flags first, then I'm going to go back and give you the response. So don't freak out that there are empty, empty blanks. We're going to go back and we're going to catch those. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Red flag number one that I'm going to wave that you need to know and you need to recognize this in your marriage is distance. Red flag number one is distance. Now, when I say distance, I'm not talking about physical distance, okay, that you're far, far apart. I'm talking about emotional distance. Emotional distance means you're not intentional about connecting, okay? You're not intentional about connecting. You've stopped listening to each other, maybe. You've stopped dating each other. You've stopped being together. You've stopped prioritizing your relationship. Instead of your paths intersecting regularly, what happens is, is you start to live two parallel lives, And you know what parallel lines are, right? They're lines that never connect. They never cross. And sadly, there are a lot of marriages out there that have stopped intersecting, that they've stopped crossing. And the dangerous thing about about, um, distance is is that it begins really subtly. Okay, we've talked about this. You don't just wake up one day and say, you know what, we're going to emotionally disengage from each other. How does that sound? You don't do that. 
No one wakes up and does that. It doesn't work that way. It's little things. It's little things. And it usually, you can kind of think about it this way. It usually comes out in a marriage when you, when you say this. You know, we used to, and fill in the blank. You know, I remember we used, we used to date sometimes. Or, you know, we used to just sit together on the couch and, you know, we just used to snuggle and watch our favorite show. Or, or we used to, you know, we used to just sit and have coffee and, and talk. And, and when I hear that from couples, I, that, that's, a, that's a red flag because there might be some distance that's starting to create. And when I hear that for couples, I always ask them, why did you stop? Okay, if you used to, why did you stop? And the answer to that question leads to the second red flag. And the second red flag is this, distracted. We get distracted in marriage. So when I ask, why did you stop? The answer is almost 100% we got busy. We got busy. And busy, when you put that into marriage lingo, busy means distracted. And what are the major distractions in marriage? You could probably give me a whole bunch of them. But some of the major distractions in marriage are kids, job, hobbies, stress, parents or in-laws, fatigue, activities, finances, trying to keep up an image. You know, you're trying to be like, like that family over there, so you're busy trying to make your house look like that, make your kids look like that, make your marriage look like that. Selfishness, escapes, and sometimes another relationship. Now, not all distractions, what I'm talking about here, not all of those are bad. I don't want you to hear me just saying, and kids, if you're in here, I don't want you to hear this, Jimmy thinks kids are bad. No, kids aren't bad. Kids are good. We like kids. We have three of them, okay? If we didn't like kids, we wouldn't have three. We'd have one and go, oh, we're done with that. No, I'm just kidding. We have three. Well, kids are good, okay? Having a job, a job is not a bad thing. A job is good. A job helps provide for, for your family, okay? That's, that's not a bad thing. Having a hobby uh, having a hobby is not bad, doing something that you enjoy. But what's bad is when those things take you away from investing and nurturing your relationship with your spouse on a consistent basis. It's bad when those things take you away from investing and nurturing your relationship with your spouse on a consistent basis. That's bad. And it's easy to justify those things too. You know, well, the kids, you, we can't just throw them in the corner. We've we got to spend time with them. We, they've got lots of activities. Uh, my job, the, you know, my job requires me to go. I've got to travel. I've got to do these things. Um, I, I just, or I just need some time to unwind and relax. I'm, I'm just so tense. You know, all these are legitimate. I get it. Having kids, it's, it's, it's stressful and it, it's fun. It, it's rewarding, but it's also, it's very busy. You know, and work does have its daily demands. And taking care of yourself, you know, working out, self-care, that, that's important. That's an important issue. But I'm warning you, but what I want to warn you about, what the red flag is, is that those things cannot come at the expense of your marriage. They can't come at the expense of your marriage. When your marriage is always pushed to the side because of other important things, then what happens is the distance grows larger and you're more vulnerable to, as I've said before, something or someone to fill that gap that was formerly occupied by your spouse. You know, just because you have kids, doesn't, it doesn't mean that you still don't have needs that were to be, supposed to be met by your spouse. Just because you have a job that requires a lot of time doesn't mean that you still don't crave intimacy and, and connection with your spouse. And when those things aren't being met by your spouse, and oftentimes what we'll do is we'll search elsewhere or we'll go elsewhere. That means that you could, you know, you could maybe stay at work longer. You just work longer because you're finding satisfaction or, or, or you're finding identity there at work. Or maybe you spend more time with your hobbies. If you're an exercise guru, then maybe you're, you're at the gym longer or you're going for longer runs or bike rides. You know? Or maybe... You, you invest yourself more in your kids. You just put all your time and all your attention on your kids. But here's the thing. When those things aren't being met, okay, what we choose to do is we, we choose to find those needs met somewhere else. We could put ourselves into social media, the Internet, TV. And sometimes, you know, we, we look to another individual. When spouses are distracted and not connecting, then what can happen, too, is it can lead to resentment, can lead to disappointment, frustrations, and anger towards each other, which that leads to our third red flag. So there's distance, there's distracted, and our third one that we're going to wave this morning that hopefully, if you see it, you'll do something about it, is destructive. 
a destructive marriage. And in a destructive marriage, negativity becomes the overarching sentiment in the home. You find it harder and harder to see good in the relationship, and you're keenly aware of each other's shortcomings. In a destructive marriage, your arguments, are, they become more personal, and they're about each other instead of really dealing about an issue. Destructive marriages are prone to little things becoming bigger things than they really should be. Every little thing sets off a, a huge something. You find yourself taking things personally. In a destructive marriage, your, your focus shifts to yourself, and you become all about self-preservation, and you really stop thinking about what can make our marriage great. In a destructive marriage, you don't really take time to stop and think, you know, what am I doing to contribute to all this? How am I, how am I making this problem worse in our home? Is there something that I can do to, to maybe make things better? In a destructive marriage, you're not doing that. You're just assuming it's your spouse's fault. You say, well, he just needs, he needs to get over it, or she just needs to grow up, or, you know, that's their problem. That's not mine. You see all those things? All those things raise red flags. In a, in a destructive marriage, you're not patient, you're not kind, you're rude to each other, you start talking bad about your spouse to other people. Sure, maybe it's joking, joking at first, but then you find yourself belittling your spouse, maybe in front of people or, or saying negative things about her more or him more and more. You start to insist on your own ways. You find that more and more what your spouse does just irritates you. You start to resent your spouse's job, their relationship with the kids, their relationships with other people. You stop dealing with stuff or you lie about it and say everything's fine just so you don't have to face it. You find yourself with uh, thoughts of doubt creeping in. And instead of hoping for the best in your marriage, what you end up doing is just assuming that it's going to be bad. Again, those things, they, they don't happen overnight. This is a process, and sometimes it's a slow process that may be years in the making, but you notice the signs. Okay, you see it coming, and to ignore it is to choose to be selfish, and to choose to be foolish, sorry. So we see the red flags, we see the warnings, okay? All the things that I've listed, do you see any of that in your marriage? Do you recognize any of those? Have you started, have any of these red flags kind of started to creep up a little bit in your marriage? Well, if so, what do you do? Okay, well, here comes, here comes the, the good news. Here comes the, the whole idea that, hey, there's something that we can do about this. So if we go back up to distance, when you see distance in your marriage, you want to immediately work to reconnect. You want to immediately work to reconnect. One of the most dangerous things that can happen in a marriage is when we get used to the distance. You know, when you get used to it, then there's no urgency to fix it. We have to understand that emotional distance, being disconnected, is an enemy of your marriage. And Satan would love nothing more than to slowly and methodically drive a wedge between you and your spouse. Okay, notice those words, slowly and methodically. Okay, Satan's smart, okay, he's cunning, he knows, he's very wise. And so what he's, he's not going to just drop a big old bomb in your marriage, okay. No, what he's going to do is he's just going to be slow. And he's going to be intentional. Because what he wants to do is he wants to drive that wedge. That's why you have to be intentional about connecting. Think about when you were dating. Those of you who are dating now that aren't married yet, you're in a relationship. Okay, when you date, you, you, you make time for, to, to be together. You made time. You worked at connecting. That was your whole, your whole thing was you, you wanted to get connected. You didn't just assume that, that this thing would progress on its own. Okay? You worked at it. And, but for some reason, okay, when you get married... When you get married, all of a sudden couples think that that has to stop. Now, I, I understand that once you're married, you know, things change a little bit and there's a lot of stuff that comes into your life. Maybe it's not as intense as it was when you started dating, but you still, you still have to work at your relationship. It doesn't just happen. You still have to make time for one another. You still have to be intentional. In Genesis 2, 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I love that phrase, hold fast. Okay? They will hold fast. In the Hebrew, that phrase, listen, to, listen to, to the meaning of that word. Okay, It means to cling, to stick, stay close, to cleave, to keep close, to stick to, to follow, to follow closely, to join to. 
Okay? You see that in, in, in that phrase there, there is no passivity there. There's no, that doesn't just happen, but there's very much intentionality. There's very much, it, it's, it's action that we take, that we have, to, we have to stick close. We have to work at staying close, because if we don't stay close, if we don't stick together, if we're not intentional, then, then what happens is, is we're prone to start to drift. And when we start drifting... That's the red flag. Be humble. Ephesians 4, 2 through 3 says, Be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Try always to be led along together by the Holy Spirit and so be at peace with one another. A big part of our connection as husband and wife is spiritual connection. Peace in your home, peace in your marriage, that comes when you walk with the Lord together. You know, I think about the, the old, say, you probably heard this, and maybe you've said it to your kids, especially when they start dating and start going to dances. You, you always tell them, make room for Jesus. Make room for Jesus. You know what that means, right? You don't want your, your, your son or daughter too close to their boyfriend or their date that night. So you're saying, okay, let's make room for the Holy Spirit to come in there, you know, and be there. But, you know, I, that, that's a funny, but I think that's, that's a saying that we need to kind of remind ourselves um, in, when we think about our marriages, we have to make room for Jesus. When Jesus is squeezed out of the marriage, and the marriage loses its compass. It loses its guidance. Now, I realize in a room this size that there are probably people who are married, and maybe both spouses aren't believers. But Scripture is clear to us as the believer in that marriage that we need to continue to love our spouses. We need to continue to pray for our spouses. We need to lead our spouses and be the hands and feet in the face of Christ in that relationship because God wants to use you in that relationship to point people to Him. But if you have two believers, two believers who are, who are, because of their schedules, because of their lives, because of their situation, they're pushing Jesus out, then what happens is we kind of lose, we lose our true north and what we should be doing. You see, it's hard to be selfish when you want to love your wife as Christ loved the church. It's hard to demand your own way when you want to love your husband the way Christ has called you to love him. You see, Jesus doesn't create distance in the marriage but he draws you close to himself, which means it draws you closer to one another. Gentleness, humility, and patience, that, that all comes from the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Those aren't man-made things. Those, those, those don't come naturally to us. Those come from being connected as a couple to Christ, which leads to a stronger connection as a husband and wife. So when you see the distance, you need to work to reconnect. But when you start to see distraction, when you get distracted, you want to immediately work to refocus. You want to immediately work to refocus. One of the best things that you can do for your marriage is to stop down every once in a while and ask each other the simple question, how are we doing? How are we doing? And then when you answer that, you, you've got to be honest. Okay? Truth and love. You know when most couples have these? They have these when they're in crisis and they already know that something's really wrong. I think it's good for couples to periodically take some time to just say, how are we doing? Is there anything that we need to change? Anything that we need to work on? How, how are you feeling about things? And sometimes these, these conversations will last 30 seconds, a minute. I'm good, you're good, we're good, we're good. Okay, good, we're good. But sometimes these conversations will last a while. Because you just, you just want to talk through things. You just want to make sure you're just kind of readjusting, making sure that things are okay. These conversations also give us opportunities to listen and to learn how to continually and how to continue to effectively love our spouses. Here's the deal. Waiting until your car runs completely empty out of gas is a horrible time to decide, you know what, I think I should fill up. It's too late. There's even a little light that comes on, right, for some of us, Goofballs, okay, we look, at the, we look at the needle and it says it's on the E, maybe it's even past the E, and we say, ah, we're good. No, there's a light that pops on just to say, hey, in case you miss the needle, here's a reminder, you're almost out of gas. Do something about it. Wouldn't it be cool if our spouses came with like a little check engine light? That'd be awesome. Wouldn't it? That thing pops on, bing, oh, something's wrong, here we go. What, what, how are you doing? How are you feeling? No. But we, we know it. We know it already. We can tell by looking at our spouses. We can tell by, by, by listening to them, what they say, and sometimes what they don't say. We can tell. Oftentimes when people get to the marriage counselor, it's close to being too late. But that's kind of sort of human nature, isn't it? We, we go until something tells us that 
we can't go anymore. And unfortunately, that's how some people treat marriage. They go and go and they go until they can't go anymore. And when it's hanging by a thread, they go to someone and they say, fix us. Or most of the time they say, fix him or fix her. Now I'm glad that people are going to marriage counseling, but the reality is that they knew they should have gone a long time ago. Why? Because the red flags were there. They just, they just kind of busted right through them. Now let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with going to marriage counseling, by the way. I know there's, there's a stigma with counseling a lot of times, but here's the deal. You know, you, you're worried about what people say, what people think. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Who cares? It's your, it's your marriage. It's your relationship. And if it's, based, if it's based on what other people think, then it's already in trouble. Okay? It needs to be based on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ and the love that he's called you to have. And sometimes you need someone else, a different pair of eyes, a different pair of ears to come in and just listen and to help you because you're both kind of entrenched in, on your issue or your thing and you're not seeing straight. And so sometimes a therapist can come in and what a therapist does is a therapist fights for the marriage. He doesn't fight for the husband. He doesn't fight for the wife. He fights for the marriage. And a lot of times that's what's happening is no one's fighting for the marriage. And so sometimes you need that. And don't be afraid to go, okay? There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with it. I encourage you, okay? Hang on. Off of soapbox back here I go. Romans 13, 14 says, Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Romans, in Romans here, we're talking about, the, he's, he's urging the people, he's saying that the salvation is near, Night is almost over, okay? And the day is coming. Christ is returning. The time is now to stop living your life like you belong to the darkness. We are people of light. And people of light live differently. People of light do marriage differently. People of light are keenly, keenly aware that we need to maintain an intense focus on our marriage so that we don't get distracted from what God brought together. Mark 10, 9 says, Therefore, humans must not pull apart what God has put together. Distractions, they make us vulnerable to allowing something or someone to come between us and our spouses. We must be intentional about coming together, about connecting, and working to keep our marriages strong. So you want to reconnect, you want to refocus, and when you start to see, when your marriages start becoming destructive, you want to immediately work to rebuild. Immediately work to rebuild. Rebuilding means that you have to stop tearing each other down. You stop tearing each other down. It means that you have to, you have, to have some sort of plan. Okay, and a plan, that, that, that's up to you. A plan could be, you know what, we're going to stop saying these certain words to each other because we know these are, these are just buzzwords that really make each other mad or, or we know what our buttons are. So, you know what, as your husband, I'm going to choose to stop pushing those buttons, or as your wife, I'm not going to go there, I'm not going to push that button. You say, well, you know what, part of our plan is we're going to start to date, or we're going to start to look for ways to appreciate one another. We're going to create a, a, a sense of thankfulness in our marriage. We want to read a book together, a book on marriage that will help both of us. Um, maybe we need a mentor couple, someone to come in and just, you know, that, that we can learn from. Someone who's, who's further down in the marriage game, which, by the way, we have that ministry here at our church. We have mentor couples who are waiting to, to walk with, with someone who would like to have a couple. And just because you have a mentor couple doesn't mean that you have a horrible marriage. A mentor couple is just that, someone who's ahead of you and who's lived a little bit more life, lived marriage a little bit longer, and they just want to be there for you, to encourage you, to pray for you, to help you if needed. Rebuilding means that you need to apologize for your part. And to apologize means that you've got to own your own mistakes. Rebuilding means that you don't stop demanding... It means you stop demanding your rights and you look for opportunities to serve your spouse. Rebuilding means you look for the good in each other. It means that you create a climate of appreciation in your marriage. It means that you move away from the friendships that don't value or support God's plan for your marriage. 1 Corinthians 13, you guys know this one. You probably quote it by heart. Love is patient and kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Man, you want a blueprint on how to rebuild? There it is. Start there. Pick one of those attributes and go. You know what? I want to work on patience. 
I need to work on being more kind. I need to work on not being arrogant, rude, demanding my own way. I need to work on being respectful. I need to work on my resentfulness. I need to rejoice with truth. I need to see truth in my marriage. I need to be willing to bear all things. I need to hope for the good things in my marriage. That's a beautiful picture of rebuilding. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 33. This is a verse that I share with the kids. It says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I said this just a second ago, but it's worth repeating. If there's anyone, okay, and I mean anyone in your life who does not value your marriage as God would have you value it, you need to put some distance between you, yourself, and that individual immediately. If you have anyone in your life that says, you do, what you, you do what you need to do, you don't worry about him or you don't worry about her, you need to run from that relationship. You see, because they're not interested in your marriage. What they're interested in is you. Now, it's okay to have people who are interested in you, but you also have to have people around you People, other couples who value your marriage and who will fight for your marriage and who aren't afraid to speak truth into your life that will help your marriage to be stronger. If they don't value marriage, if they're constantly negative about their own marriage or if they're constantly belittling their spouse, talking about their spouse, if they constantly speak about what they would do maybe if they weren't married, you know, those people don't need to be in your inner circle. And let me tell you something. If that person is you, stop. Okay, If that's you, stop. Because what you need to do is you need to stop right there. You need to go to your spouse. You need to confess. You need to say, I'm sorry, because I've had a poor attitude. I've had a crummy attitude about our marriage, and I've let it kind of leak out in the way that I talk to my friends. And this is not just a guy thing. This is a girl thing, too. Stop. Don't let yourself be corrupted, and don't you dare corrupt someone else. And we've talked about these responses in in, in the context of marriage, but for some of you here today, some of you, before you work on your marriage, you you probably need to work on your relationship with Christ. Maybe your marriage, those red flags are popping up in your marriage because you've ignored the red flags in your walk with the Lord. Maybe today you would would say, Jesus, it's time that I reconnect. It's time that I stop letting things come between me and you. God, it's time that I commit to doing the things that you've called me to do that will help me to grow stronger in my relationship with you. Things like reading reading my Bible, spending time praying, getting into Bible study, having some accountability in my life, letting some people speak wisdom into my life. Have any of these red flags that we've talked about, have any of these these popped up in your marriage? Don't answer out loud. (laughs) But have any of these popped up Or maybe have any others come to mind. What I would tell you is don't ignore them because they're warnings. They're warnings. It's it's not telling you that it's too late. It's not saying that your marriage is over, that it's done. But like I said earlier, it is telling you that their conditions are ripe. Okay, their conditions are, are there for a storm to come into your marriage. And if you choose not to respond, it could devastate everything. Now, I'm not sure if you noticed this, but I, I was super intentional, not just intentional, super intentional, about using the word immediately when I was talking about the responses. I said you need to immediately reconnect, immediately refocus, immediately rebuild, because that's how, it, how important it is. Okay? Your marriage is not something you say, well, you know, well, when the kids get out of school this summer, we're, we'll have a little bit more time that, that we can do that. Or, you know, things are really busy at work, and if I could just get through this season, you know, or, you know, we, we've, we're, we've got our kids' schedules, so we've got to really focus in on that. No. Nope. You need to work on it immediately. God is calling for husbands and wives to love him by loving each other and living out the covenant that you guys have made with each other. Let's pray.